welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, we have Wednesday Martin on the podcast. Dr. Martin has worked as a writer and social researcher in New York City for more than two decades. The author of Step Monster and the instant New York Times bestseller Primates of Park Avenue, she writes for the online edition of Psychology Today, and her work has appeared in the New York Times and Time.com. Dr. Martin's latest book is called Untrue, Why Nearly Everything We Believe About Women, Lust, and Infidelity is Wrong, and How the New Science Can Set Us Free. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Wednesday. Thanks for having me on, Scott. My pleasure. Now, when you say that the new science can set us free, do you mean all of us? Like, will your book set men free too? You can be free too, knowing this information. Yes, I, we, we want to use science and social science to set everybody free about their sexuality. Men, women, and people who identify as neither are cordially invited to read on true. Yeah, I want them all to be part of the conversation. I love that. You know, I've been trying to represent this topic more in the psychology podcast. In fact, we recently had Justin Miller on the show talking about sexual fantasies. Well, he's a good friend and I love his work on sexual fantasies. He's great. He is great. Your book differs from his, though, in that you talk a lot about living out the reality, not just the fantasy of sex, right? Right. Not just the fantasy, the reality of female sexuality. Yay. Yeah. More sex. More sex on your podcast. More, 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 more. But when you talk about sex, what's interesting is first, there will be this tremendous hush from the other person. And then the floodgates are open once the person starts to talk or once they, you know, hear you talking or once they start to read. So I think it's a topic about which, you know, we have like this gate. And once the gate is open, People are really curious and really hungry for accurate information. I mean, I think it starts when we're so young that we get pretty bad information about sexuality. And so we're kind of conditioned that it has to be secretive or we we come from a long tradition of bad information. I mean, some people, we're still living in the shadow of sex education that's abstinence only sex education. So it's not really sex ed. So there's so much time to be made up and so much ground to cover in terms of people wanting and needing to talk about sexuality and hear about it. So that was one of the fun aspects of writing this book, just connecting, you know, with a really deep need people have for their information about sex to be scientific but also to be fun and accessible and relevant. That's what I always try to do. So I try to take the newish, the newer, the newish, and the and the brand new science and social science about female sexuality from the experts and from the studies, and kind of cross it over and make it delicious and fun. And that that's really the point of one. Sex should be delicious and fun, right? It should be candy, right? And that's what I wanted my book to be like. Yeah, it, I wanted it to be. I wanted my book to be substance that went down easily. And, you know, the title of Untrue of the book is kind of a play on words. It's because the book looks at female infidelity specifically, which is, that you know, just been mired in so much misunderstanding female infidelity and infidelity in general. But it's also, the book is also more broadly an exploration of some of the bad science and the misconceptions around female sexuality more generally. So, To be able to dispel those myths and make it all appealing has, you know, it's been a fun job and it's been fun to see how people respond to it. I bet. Hey, did you read the New Atlantic article about millennials and sex? Yeah, I did. And so it it was really interesting and great. I love how it started a big conversation. Um, So you and I know that the data on that came out some months ago, I mean, a while back. And so people in your field and in the in the sex fields have been talking about that finding for a while. Um, but people, and it's even been in the press before, but uh, it was great to see it in a big kind of think piece 
and to get people really to wrap their minds around the idea that, you know, millennials, 15% of them, I believe the figure was, were celibate. And um, one and a half, they were one and a half times more likely to not be having sex than their Gen X peers had been at that age. So really surprising findings. And then the, the stuff that about, you know, the kind of ecological circumstances that help form our sexuality. I think it's great for people to think about that. So this article went into how millennials are living at home for longer uh, because of the economy. Um, they're um, availing themselves of technology more than previous generations, so less likely to get out there and actually date and relate. And some of them are feeling financial strains in the way that previous generations didn't. So I liked the way the article balanced this surprising finding with helping us understand that human sexuality is pretty flexible and it depends a lot on its container. So it was great to see that. And also, you know, I think it's time for us to stop thinking of millennials in one way. We've had one thought about millennials, which is we've just been flipping out about hookup culture. And this article forced us to think of them in more nuanced ways, maybe, and think of them beyond our own personal preoccupations with, you know, what we think of as the horrors of hookup culture and think of them more broadly. So I'm glad that that information is out there. And it's uh, the kind of stuff that I tried to have in Untrue. You know, new findings, new social science that challenges the way we're used to thinking about sexuality. Can I just say one other thing that was really interesting? The research that shows that millennial women are actually sexual adventuresses compared to millennial men. I get into in Untrue the way that there's some data suggesting that millennial women outpace millennial men when it comes to infidelity. Women in their 20s are twice as likely to go to a BDSM dungeon or a sex party. They're much more likely to have group sex. Um, so that's a, a surprising and interesting thing about millennials, too, that the young women are adventurous, more adventurous than their male peers. And it begs the question, are they just reporting more honestly? And, you know, do we get socialized out of being more adventurous as we age? So millennials, full of surprises. Thank you, millennials. Wow, you're really breaking down a lot of stereotypes here. Now, did you, did you say that women are more likely to cheat than men? Yes, some interesting information that came out of a recent, a crunch of uh, about a you know, decade's worth of the general social survey. Wendy Wang at the Institute for Family Studies did a kind of a deep dive into who's cheating in 2017. And she found that women, ever married women between the ages of 18 and 29 were slightly more likely to have cheated on a spouse than men the same age. Now, when we factor in that we are unlikely to feel 100% comfortable disclosing to a stranger that we have committed infidelity and that there's asymmetrical stigma attached for women, that it's, you know, there, it's a little harder for women to admit it. We have to consider that they might be in that age range, women might be outpacing their male peers by even more than it appears. So that was some really interesting data that came out. And when you dig into it deeper, what you see is that there are a number of really very good representative or national weighted samples, suggesting that men and women cheat at equal rates until well into their 40s. A YouGov study done in the UK and the US showed that the difference between men and women cheating was a single percentage point, 20% for men versus 19% for women. So as you and I know, that's a statistically insignificant difference. And it's likely that because because women are less likely to disclose uh, transparently that those numbers are at the very least even. So when you look at the data, there are all kinds of challenges to the easy assumption that we've made over the years that 
you know, men are wired to cheat, they're more likely to cheat, and that women are sort of wired for monogamy. We're starting to see that that's untrue. Very interesting. I mean, in general, we know from evolutionary psychology that we didn't evolve for any particular sexuality, right? There's no sex that we're wired to like more than any other kind of sex. We evolved our species as really flexible um, social and sexual strategists. It's just in us, uh, which, which is what makes studying human sexuality so incredibly interesting. Agreed. So what's female flexuality? So female flexuality is the term that I used when I was writing about the work of Lisa Diamond. Um, Lisa Diamond is a sex researcher in Salt Lake City at the University of Utah. And some years before that, she was at Cornell, and she told me that she would drive her Toyota Corolla all over upstate New York interviewing women about their sexuality. And she told me that when she was studying at Cornell some years ago, you know, Everybody else was studying like infant cognition in her department and she was studying female sexuality. And she told me she used to wonder, like, am I ever going to get a job? You know, and, and it was it was tough. But did she ever because she came up with this great idea? She was studying a group of women, roughly 100 women. She's now been studying this group of women for 20 years. And as she recorded their stories and their experiences of sexuality, she noticed that there was this thing going on where sometimes the women were having sex with men and sometimes they were having sex with women. And sometimes they were, you know, identifying, for example, as gay for a long time. And then suddenly they would want to have sex with a man or they were straight for a long time and considered them straight and considered that that was their orientation. But things would happen and they would be having sex with women. Okay, so until Lisa Diamond started thinking about it, everybody would look at this information and say, what is all this noise in the data about female sexuality? This stuff, this passing bisexuality, they sometimes called it. What is all this noise in the data? And Lisa Diamond's brilliance was she said, I don't think this thing that you're calling passing bisexuality is noise in the data. I think it is the data. And she dug into it and she coined a term called female sexual fluidity to describe what she was seeing, which is that in her view of it, we all have an orientation. We all have a sexual orientation. That's a real thing. But for some of us, our sexual orientation doesn't provide the last word on who we're attracted to. And if we're in a context that's conducive to us switching it up, we might do so. And so, you know, a great example of this is say that you're a woman who your orientation is that you're heterosexual. But you're at an all women's college, for example, and sex ratios are skewed and there are lots of women. Um, and also uh, you're in an environment that's conducive to experimentation where there's not a lot of stigma around that. And say you have a really, really close female friend who's a lesbian or she's bisexual. These conditions on the ground, if you are a woman and you are sexually fluid, would lead to it being more likely that you express it. Um, but we see female sexual fluidity in lots of different contexts. Sociologists had this really unfortunate term for it. They call it the harem effect. And they talk about, sociologists have written for many years about how, for example, in women's prisons, in all women's schools, or I wrote about it happening in the Hamptons, right, which is the summer habitat of a group of very wealthy people from Manhattan. And in the summer, the men and women are separated. And a lot of these assumedly heterosexual women who are married to men are living in the Hamptons all summer uh, without their husbands, only seeing their husbands on the weekend. And a lot of them form intimate attachments and have a, a number of them that told me about uh, forming intimate attachments with trainers and having uh, sexual involvements with them. Um, now, these are women who are married or in long term heterosexual partnerships. Often they have children and their whole life is is based on heterosexual normativity, but in the right ecological, in particular ecological circumstances, they'll be open to a sexual relationship with a woman. So we see that 
ecology plays a big role in female sexuality. Lisa Diamond saw that early on. Now, here's the cool thing. For a long time, she thought that sexual fluidity was something more inherent to women. And she wrote about why that might be. Recently, she published a paper and the paper was called I Was Wrong. And in this paper, Lisa Diamond said that after studying this group of nearly 100 women uh, for 20 years and having having thought based on that data that sexual fluidity was a uniquely female thing. She then went and interviewed a group of young men in Salt Lake City. And they told her surprising things, the ones who were identified as heterosexual. They told her surprising things about the fact that they liked watching porn of men together, that they were interested in being with men, that they had been with men. And what she came up with after that is that sexual fluidity is not just dependent on your ecological circumstances, but ideology plays a really big role. And she said, these younger men in Salt Lake City, these millennial men, were able to push the eject button on the stigma that older men feel men in their 40s and 50s and beyond, the stigma that they feel about male homosexuality or the stigma they feel about just the idea of male sexual fluidity, these younger men, in having escaped that, were showing levels of sexual fluidity comparable to what women were showing. So it's a work in progress. Hey, here we are back to millennials, just mixing everything up for us. (laughs) I know. They are really changing the boundaries of gender identity, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they're pushing us, right, in new directions. I mean, it's so funny because I had not expected the number of people that I spoke to in researching this book to tell me things like I'm post binary or I'm gender fluid. Um, that's a real um, change in the landscape that millennials are driving. It was so funny. I, this is just, I was at a party and uh, I introduced a woman in her 20s to a woman who's in her early 50s. And the woman in her early 50s identifies as gay. And so she was talking to this younger woman and I was there when the younger woman said, I'm post-binary, I'm, you know, I identify as sexually fluid. And the woman in her early 50s turned to her and said, I'm 50. I'm in my 50s. Are you gay or not? (laughs) And so you saw right there in that moment at a party in somebody's living room, you saw the sort of clash of cultures and how we're undergoing a shift. Wait, what is post-binary? I've heard of non-binary. Is that the same thing as post-binary? I've heard both, I should say. I've heard non-binary and post-binary. Do you think these young people have a lot of wisdom about these topics that older folks just don't get? I think they do. And um, I just had to have so much respect for the people who educated me in this way. You know, I was coming from a kind of worn paradigm. I started thinking about this book on true. And I thought, you know, I've kind of made a career out of studying women we love to hate, right? I wrote a book about, I wrote a book about our cultural antipathy towards stepmothers. And I, I said that I thought that there was gender bias at play there. And I wrote a book about rich mommies on the Upper East Side, a group of people that, you know, readers seem to all have an opinion about. So then I said, well, you know, I've written, I am really attracted to these women that we have cultural hostility to. Because I think they teach us a lot about ourselves. Why are we so hostile toward these groups of women? What is it about them that triggers us? So I said, well, naturally, now I have to look at women who refuse monogamy. I have to look at, in quotes, the adulteress, right? Because she's a real lightning rod for our cultural rage. Okay, so I decide to do this, and this is the great thing about social science. As soon as you want to look into something, you realize, well, the ground has been changing underneath my feet even as I've been thinking about this issue. Because what happened was it wasn't there, you know, I had said I had used the term the adulteress in quotation marks, knowing that our attitudes have changed historically and that she was sort of a a rhetorical figure, a literary figure, um, a signifier. But once I started researching the book, I realized 
how much has changed and how little has changed. I mean, we now have women sort of at the forefront of the polyamory movement in our country. We have women as sort of yeah, vocal proponents of consensual non-monogamy. Consensual non-monogamy is a thing now. So the whole landscape of what used to be called adultery uh, had changed a lot. But I did find that, you know, the definition of adultery or infidelity or whatever you want to call it had really undergone a sea change with the emergence of the consensual non-monogamy movement, if you will. What's the consensual non-monogamy movement? Some people call it CNM. And basically what's emerged, and I think we have gay men to thank for this a lot, is over the last decades, it's increasingly common for straight people now to decide that rather than presume they want to be monogamous for life with their life partner, or even to presume that they want to be monogamous with a long-term partner or even in a shorter partnership, people are now having conversations out of the gate about what they want and, you know, whether sexual exclusivity is for them. So I do believe that this started mostly with gay men. I like to say that gay men gentrified consensual non-monogamy for straight people, sort of the way they gentrified San Francisco, right? That you speak to therapists who work with couples, they will often tell you, and I interviewed a number of them in the course of researching this book, I would sit down with these couples therapists and they would say, well, I first became aware that there was a sort of a sea change going on because I had worked with gay men for many years. And these couples would come to me and they would say, we're open or we're non-monogamous or we don't do monogamy or we play, right? And the gay men we're using these terms. Of course, it wasn't all gay men. It wasn't all gay couples. But a lot of couples therapists and sex researchers who have a long history of working with the gay community will tell you that they first that, that gay men kind of pioneered this. Eventually, um, straight people caught on. And, you know, we had books like the Ethical Slut by Dottie Essman. We had Sex Dawn by Chris Ryan and, and Casilda Jetha. So we had all of these books coming out. Esther Perel's books have been important to a lot of people and the work of Michelle Shankman. All this started coming out and people over perhaps the last decade, especially we've seen straight people cottoning in new ways to consensual non-monogamy. Um, so one of, the things, you know, one of the things that I write about, and we don't have straight up a lot of uh, data on it yet. But if people are interested in learning more about consensual non-monogamy, they might like to look at the work of the sex researcher, Amy Moores. Amy Moores discovered that between 2006 and 2015, our Google searches for terms like open relationship and polyamory increased exponentially. At the same time that, you know, 91% of people told Gallup pollsters in 2013 that they thought that infidelity was wrong, they're doing these Google searches. So I like to say that in the aggregate, Americans may be monogamists, but we're curious about our options. And Amy Moore's work sort of points to that. Also, the work of, of a researcher named Terry Connolly, I believe she's at the University of Michigan. So if people really want to dig into the research about the emergence of consensual non-monogamy as kind of a movement over the last decade or two, um, they'll probably want to look at the work of those researchers. And then there's polyamory, which is sort of a subgroup of consensual non-monogamy. You know, usually we divide consensual non-monogamy into different groups. Swingers, um, who kind of had their heyday in the 70s, but uh, they're still out there and they're still going. Then people in what we call open relationships. And that's kind of a misnomer. A lot of times the ethos of an open relationship is, you know, you go off and do your thing and I'll go off and do my thing. And we together will be home base, but we'll keep it kind of quiet. And then the polyamory community, people who 
identify as poly uh, are in relationships that they might call throuples or triads because it's a relationship of three people or quads, a relationship of four people. And often in a polyamorous relationship, um, there won't be a hierarchy. Like in among swingers and people in open relationships, the dyad, right, the pair bond is pretty much the relation, the strongest relationship, the relationship that takes precedence. But people who are polyamorous uh, might live in an arrangement or be in a romantic and personal arrangement where there is no hierarchy and all four people's relationships with each other matter just as much. Or in a thruple or a triad, again, there might be no hierarchy. There might be no pair bond as home base. And people are making, uh, trying to make these relationships work. So I think the emergence of polyamory and it's sort of coming out in a big way. There are tell about it and there are lawyers who draw up contracts for people in polyamorous relationships and therapists uh, who treat polyamorous people. They told me that their couches have to be really big. <laughs> so there's there's a whole in- industry emerging to help these people. So this is a new wrinkle in the culture that is really fascinating and important for us to look at as well. And kind of challenges this whole idea of what is infidelity? What is monogamy? What do people want now? Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for the past four years. It's been a real labor of love. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make it a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review in iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Another thing you can do is donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. So thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Wow, so it almost seems like it's a free-for-all now. <laughs> like, you know, like it could be, like any combination is possible. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you make of, um, you know, not every listener to our podcast is going to be okay with that. You know, you can imagine there would be certain, yeah. maybe some cons- more conservative listeners mm-hmm. or whatnot that are not, uh, that think maybe we can get out of hand a little bit too much. What, how do you mm-hmm. respond to that sort of thing? You know, there is no real response except to say, first of all, that, for example, on the topic of polyamory. Absolutely, we live in a culture that has pretty much fetishized um, the dyad, the pair bond. Mm. And one of the things that we have wrong um, in our attachment to the pair bond, which however we might feel about it, and a lot of us love being pair bonded. We love being in a monogamous, in a sexually exclusive long-term relationship. And a lot of us thrive there. Uh, So that's important to say. But a lot of people might think, well, that's the way it's always been. So that's the way it should be. In fact, you know, when we look to our evolutionary prehistory and when we look to the data about that, what we see is that living in monogamous pair bonds is pretty new for human beings. It started between 10 and 12,000 years ago, which through the lens of anthropology is like yesterday. So people might be interested to know that the old idea in anthropology was from a guy named Irv, Irv DeVore. He was an anthropologist who came up with the man, the hunter hypothesis, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It was this idea that we evolved in monogamous pair bonds, right? And the guy would go off and like hunt and then bring meat back to his woman and his baby in the cave. Okay. Now that Hmm. idea persisted for a really long time because it really fit nicely into the way we ourselves were living when that idea came into vogue in the 50s and 60s, when we did live in monogamous pair bonds. And of course, we projected back in the science that it it was ever thus. This is natural. Uh, this must be how we're intended to live. Meanwhile, um, 
so some female anthropologists came into the field and started looking at the actual behavior, you know, of our species and other species on the ground. And they realized that when we look at traditional hunter-gatherer populations. When we look at non-human primates who are our closest non-human relatives, and when we really, you know, look to the cross-cultural data, what we see is the overwhelming likelihood that we evolved not as, you know, straight, sexually exclusive couples, but as cooperative breeders. And cooperative breeding means that we lived in large pretty rangy groups, and that we raised our offspring cooperatively uh, because that was really the most efficient way to make sure that they survived to an age where they themselves could reproduce. And to facilitate this happening and to create social cohesion and bonds, uh, we also tended to mate cooperatively. So monogamy really is a very recent invention. It's 10 or 12,000 years old. And I like to say that we're still having growing pains getting used to it. But we have embraced it. And there is tremendous resistance sometimes to the idea of people just not wanting to be pair bonded. And everything from us, you know, calling women who don't get married spinsters, to thinking that people who are polyamorous or consensually non-monogamous to pathologizing them, whether it's psychologists pathologizing them and saying that they must have had some kind of early life trauma, to therapists, couples therapists saying that there's no way that non-monogamy can work, uh, to women being slut shamed. There's a whole range of ways that people reject people rejecting being pair bonded. So the resistance is real, but the urge to experiment and live beyond monogamy is just as real. I spoke to Lisa Diamond about it, and she said to me, we do see that polyamory is becoming increasingly popular. We do see that women are driving the polyamory movement, which really surprised me. Uh, We do see increasing numbers of heterosexual people, not just gay men, wanting to sort of push at the edges and invent relationships that work for them. That said, Lisa Diamond said to me, there is no monogamy revolution in our near future. She sees monogamy being with us for the long term, and um, she doesn't see it going anywhere anytime soon. There, you know, there are other people like my friend Misha Lin, who's the co-founder of Open Love New York and the past president of that organization. Mm -hmm. She's really cool. And it's a it's a support group for people who are polyamorous or polycurious. You know, she would argue uh, that this that she sees that this will change society in a real and a big way. And I should say, you know, this isn't the first time that people in recent history, even that people have pushed against the confines of monogamous marriage forever. The transcendentalists and the romantic, the romantic poets. So first the romantic poets and then the transcendentalists uh, did all these experiments with marriage and relationships, and they often lived communally and rejected monogamy. Uh, The second big wave of consensual non-monogamy and the historian Elizabeth Sheff who writes a lot about consensual non-monogamy, gets into this if people are more interested in following up and learning even more um, about the history of consensual non-monogamy. She calls the transcendentalists the, and romantic poets the first wave. She says the second wave of consensual non-monogamy in our country was the sort of free love era of the 70s. And now she's calling right now the third wave of consensual non-monogamy in our country. People might resist it, it might make them angry, but boy, they're doing those Google searches and, and people are curious about it. They sure are. I mean, that to yeah. be curious is to be human. Yeah, exactly. For sure. And the yeah. more the more taboo it is, you know, as Justin Lee Miller and I talked about, you know, the right. more, the more the- taboos play into it and plain old science, right? Because as other experts I interviewed told me, look, being monogamous, truly sexually exclusive yeah. for an entire lifetime. Yeah. with one person and being enthusiastic about it does not conform to any model we have of desensitization to stimuli over time 
right, of habituation to a stimulus over time. It doesn't make sense from a scientific standpoint that we are going to be able to maintain a monogamous life easily and with zeal for a lifetime. So I think it helps people a lot when they just have permission to understand that there are good reasons that monogamy is hard for them and that they have a number of options to consider what steps to take next. Yeah, there's there's clearly huge individual differences in that. Like yes. there's the dimension that called sociosexuality that yes. has the scale has an, yes. like a one to five rating. Sex without love is okay would be one of the items. And you find, I mean, that individual difference variables is, is by the way not correlated with psychopathology. So you know something very good about what you're you're doing is showing that there's all sorts of variations. And and if you may be high in sociosexuality, you think love without yes. sex is okay, or you think like, you know, monogamous ideas are attractive to you. There's, it doesn't mean something's wrong with you. But at the same time, you know, there are people who do go 40, 50 years of marriage and, and are quite content, if not find it a very spiritual, wonderful, meaningful experience and not having sex with anyone else. So They sure yeah. do. Yeah. They sure do. And we find also, um, to your point, Scott, you're absolutely right. And there is a lot of research on how different sexual personalities yeah. do, do with non-monogamy. And here are some interesting findings that were surprising to me. Well, this is a kind of, this finding makes intuitive sense, but attachment style yeah. has a lot I to love, do with, I love attachment theory. Yeah, I do too. And it has a lot to do with how well people do with consensual non-monogamy. Um, unsurprisingly, people with anxious attachment styles uh, have a harder time with consensual non-monogamy and people with very secure attachment styles uh, tend to be the people who thrive in these arrangements. Well, it makes sense. And, I, think mm-hmm. it, I think it does make sense. You know, It does. Now, here's the other thing that was really interesting. Terry Connolly yeah. at the last Society for Sex Therapy and Research Conference in Philadelphia, uh, the 2018 Ooh, Philadelphia. Woo, yeah. yeah. She presented some interesting new findings and she did Uh, She talked about findings from a study about relationship satisfaction Mm -hmm. and self-reported jealousy. And here's what she found. She looked at several groups of people. She looked at people who were poly and people who were swingers on the one hand. On the other hand, she looked at people in open marriages and monogamists. And she asked them to self-rate their levels of jealousy. The most jealous people were the people in open relationships, which remember is usually a misnomer. Usually what you're saying is you're in a pair bond and you're saying, you go do your thing. I'll go do my thing. I don't want to see or hear about it, right? So those people and monogamists reported the highest levels of jealousy about their spouses. In In the swinger group, and the group of polyamorous people, they reported the lowest levels of jealousy. Now, it gets even more interesting because the polyamorists and the people who are swingers reported the highest levels of relationship and life satisfaction, whereas the people in open relationships and monogamous relationships those levels they reported were lower. And Terry Conley suggested that the key here might be a couple of things. First of all, that people in the polyamory community and people who are swingers have a community of support. They're practicing a a culturally stigmatized or taboo behavior, but they have created a community of support around themselves and they don't feel alone. So that might be why they reported higher relationship and sort of life satisfaction. Whereas if you're in an open relationship, you don't have a community of support when you're having an extramarital or an extra pair relationship. And you might feel kind of lonely and alienated and like there's something weird about you. So the importance of community comes into play. And then the other thing that a lot of experts told me that I think is evident in this research is that reporting a high level of relationship satisfaction, if you're in a poly or a swinger relationship, you have to communicate with each other a lot. First of all, you have to communicate to say, we're going to do this thing. Then you have to communicate to be on the same page. Then every time you're having an adventure with another person or in a relationship with another person, you have to be communicating effectively about that. So 
to my complete surprise, and maybe to a lot of surprise of your listeners and people who read my book, people in swinging and polyamorous relationships report really high relationship satisfaction, and they have excellent communication skills. I love that point. And you also find the S&M community, there's, uh, you know, communication is of the utmost importance. Yeah, with and, people who are yeah. in kink. Yeah, people yeah. who are into kink. Yeah. Not only, not only about consent, right? But just to, rule, to you be, know, setting to the be, ground rules. Setting yeah. the ground rules and communicating about what you like and what you want to do. And also, again, what we have with people who are into kink is, luckily for them, they have a community. Monogamists might be basically the whole world, but we don't have a particular community. And nor do people in open relationships, if it's in the traditional sense of open, uh, where that's a misnomer and they're not communicating with each other about it. They're saying, you go do your thing, you go do mine. They're kind of splintered off and isolated. So some surprising findings about the psychological well-being of people doing things that we might a while of have said, oh, that's kind of pathological behavior. Yes. And that's a that's a very good service you're doing with, with your work and writing. I wanted to talk about some other findings I've seen in the literature that I want to reconcile with all this. You talked about attachment style as being one important individual differences variable. But another one I found, which um, I think there should be more research on, is disagreeable women. So the, the, the agreeableness dimension of personality seems to be the biggest predictor of sociosexuality. So those who score very, very high in disagreeableness, particularly the women, you don't find this effect among the men as much. They really are not happy with this, with one partner. Like they are really like, you know, they really like sex without love, you know? And I mean, on one sense, it's not shocking, like the, the agreeableness dimension predicts the extent to which intimacy Conform and, and conformity and conformity is right. That's correct. Rule conformity and politeness. That's um, right. There's two compassion, two aspects of that. There's a, a compassion and there's politeness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and they're both correlated with that. So I've always, I've always, it, it dawned, like when I saw Peter, when I saw David Schmidt's research, for instance, on um, cross cultural, uh, and also David Buss's research on uh, that, like, why do people have sex? You know, um, uh, and you always find that one very like disagreeable women are like are off the charts in terms of like trying everything. And and you know, oh, go ahead, finish. No, 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 you go. You oh, go. okay. Well, I just love, first of all, I want to suggest a T-shirt, disagreeable woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, is that better than nasty women? And I want to point out, like the sort of you know, the nomenclature is really important. Think about how if and the causality, the sort of chicken egg aspects of this. Think about what it takes to be a woman who dares to acknowledge the fact that she wants more than one sexual partner. Yeah, she's going against the cultural pressures. That's right. Yes. So, yeah, the sex researcher uh, Alicia Walker talks about this in terms of um, these that women who dare to refuse monogamy. And, sh you know, to me, these women are brave. We might judge them harshly. We might think there's something wrong with them. But it is uh, pretty brave for the following reason. First of all, you know, if you're a woman who refuses monogamy, not only are you going against the well-established cultural script that healthy, uh, mature mentally solid people are monogamous and that monogamy is sort of the hallmark of maturity, right? And healthiness. Uh, you're going against that script, but you're also going against the script that women are less sexual than men, that women have lower libidos than men do. And you're going against the script that women are naturally sort of more hearthbound and more naturally monogamous, which, you know, a lot of bad science asserted that and the science has been contradicted by newer science that women did not, uh, you know, are not wired to be more monogamous than men. But it still takes a lot to go against the grain of those very deep cultural beliefs. So it's almost like disagreeableness factors in, in a way, just what it takes uh, to push against a cultural container that's telling women that they desire less and that they're more naturally monogamous. It's a, it's a really interesting issue at the heart of female infidelity is daring and kind of being a double renegade. Yeah, I believe that actually that point was made in the discussion section of the Why Humans Have Sex article, Cindy Meston and David Buss wrote. I believe that it was. If not, I'm maybe confusing another pair. But yeah, that they, that that has a, a point that's been made about why maybe that effect is so prominent. But I've always thought that there should be more research on that specific subpopulation. Yeah. However, like in fact, I'd like to do that research on 
disagreeable well, women and sex. Hey, we'll talk about it. We, yeah. This is something yeah. for us to talk about when we have coffee. Yeah, that would be a great study to collaborate on. Yeah, I'd love that. You know what else has been really interesting in terms of female infidelity or being disagreeable or kind of being a, you have to necessarily be a renegade in certain ways to be female and to own your sexuality. I mean, people like Cardi B are helping to change that. Female Mm -hmm. sex researchers are helping to change that. Um, But when we look at the behavior of different female species on the ground, back to this issue of why we have sex. You know, we used to bend over backwards to figure out the reasons that females of many species had sex. And just in primatology alone, what what has come to light is that, and this is the view of evolutionary biology, you know, females have sex because it feels good. And, you know, non-human female primates and human females have orgasms. And um, some of us you know, human and non-human are capable of multiple orgasm. So one thing that's emerging right now, I know this seems tangential to your point about why we have sex, but, you know, we've recently discovered that the human female clitoris has a much more extensive anatomy than we ever knew. Um, You know, it's not just a little button like we used to think. It's hundreds of times bigger. We now have uh, new imaging thanks to the Australian neurologist Helen O'Connell who mapped it out and showed most of the clitoris is on the inside of a woman's body. It's very extensive. It's sort of this super highway of sensation. And it's there for no other reason than to feel good. Um, So we have to ask Hmm. ourselves, wow wow, why did women evolve this uh, particular anatomy? And then we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean uh, that women have as much erectile tissue, pound per pound, ounce per ounce, as men do? Um, What does it mean that women wake up with erections every morning, Mm -hmm. that women get hard-ons when they're aroused? What is this new discovery about human female anatomy? Uh, Tell us about the human female and about females of some other mammal species. But we know that human females and bonobo and chimp females and macaque, uh, six species of female macaques, uh, that they have orgasms. And that orgasm, some, sometimes multiple orgasms, and that that would have been the ultimate payoff. And that seeking pleasure is part of the evolutionary prehistory of human female sexuality and that the clitoris is there as proof of that. So we still have a lot more thinking to do before our culture can catch up with this new science. It'll be interesting uh, to watch us try to reconcile ourselves to it since we've been taught that women are less sexual. Right. I agree. And it'll be interesting to look at some new methodologies to to get at that in more nuanced ways. With that said, there is a very, very, very large literature on average sex differences in sex drive between men and women. Uh, you're not like overturning all of these thousands of studies showing that like on average, like men are more visual, men are more interested in short term flings. Than women on average. Are you challenging that as well? The the uh, on average of findings. I think, I think the the most sort of revolutionary and surprising finding for people in untrue would probably be um, the work, and you know, it emerges from the work of, for example, Kristen Mark, Marta Miana, um, and numerous other. Uh, Cynthia Graham, who have found um, in their studies that long-term relationships are particularly hard, not on male desire, but on female desire. And that the institutionalization of relationships, when you put a ring on it, or when men and women, because mostly, unfortunately, the sex research still focuses on on heterosexual couples. We're we're making some progress, but it's slow. Um, But what we know of the sex research on heterosexual couples, the newer research is suggesting, again, that when men and women move in together, for example, it's female interest that declines and it's female desire that suffers. Um, We have this wonderful uh, couple of studies um, from Dietrich Klausman uh, at the University of Hamburg, who found in 2002 and 2006, he looked at a range of adults from college age into uh, their 40s, so a whole range of adults, over the course of 90 months. And he found that when they were in committed relationships and 
these men and women over the course of 90 months, that male desire over the course of 90 months kind of slowly ebbed like this over the course of the 90 month period, right? Which is what, roughly eight years? Here's what happened to female desire. Started at the same level, right? With what I like to call sex insanity. <laughs> but the, te- <laughs> the technical term for that, I guess, is limerence, right? Yeah. When you're in a new relationship, it's so exciting. You want to have sex all the time. And here's what happened between years one and four for the women. Instead of the slow, gradual decline over 90 months that we saw among men, what we have is within the first year or four years, but often within the first year, female desire plunges takes a huge nosedive. Now, we used to read that as an indication that what do you expect? Women like sex less than men do. But what the newer thinking is, is that we have to consider the possibility that women need variety and novelty every bit as much as men do, and perhaps more, and that what's happening within those first four years, and again, this isn't just Klausman's study, it's Miana's work, it's Cynthia Graham's findings, it's uh, Kristen Mark's findings with, with pretty large sample sizes. Let's consider that what's happening is that it's not just that women like sex less than men do. It's that they struggle more with partnered sex with a single partner over the long term. And we need more fixes for women maybe even than we do for men. I mean, there's so, all, there are alternative hypotheses too, right? There, it could be simply, to me, the more personal explanation is just men are not pleasing women sexually. You well, know, in a relationship. And, and and then to take that one step further, and I do believe in parsimonious explanations, sort of. But do you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. it, you, know, you know, like, let's start there. Maybe it's that, like, maybe young men are not really learning, like, pleasing the woman is important, you know? That would explain it among younger people, and yet Cosman's findings and these other findings are a range of age groups. And what we see that, to me, is indisputable is that female sexual boredom is real, and that it kicks in earlier than male sexual boredom. And my method is the comparative method. I would never just look at the sex research. I would never just look at psychology. I would also look at what do we see among non-human primates mm-hmm. and what do we see in other cultures? So when I get into untrue about female sexual boredom, kicking in sooner and women needing variety and novelty every bit as much as men do. I'm drawing on the primatological literature, uh, which finds that the single most observable sexual behavior of non-human female primates is the search for novelty, as well as over here, the sex research about women's reported uh, boredom and turning off sex in a coupled relationship before men do, combined with over here, you know, the worldwide ethnographic data. So to me, there is a really compelling case to be made um, that women are not made for monogamy any more than men are. I mean, we know from the work of uh, the wonderful Patricia Gowady in her lab at UCLA, she recently discovered that everything we believed based on the work of Angus Bateman, who asserted in 1948 that males benefit from mating multiply and females don't benefit from mating multiply. Right. We believed that for years and years and years. We believed that women were naturally monogamous because females of most species didn't benefit from mating multiply and that males did benefit from it. Patricia Goati goes back and tries to replicate the study. She can't replicate the study because females do benefit from mating multiply. And we learn that from primatologists who did meticulous field studies demonstrating how non-human female primates benefit from mating multiply, but also looking at human populations um, like the Pimbwe of Tanzania or the Himba of Namibia or the Mosu people in China, in all these contexts where women have multiple partners and it increases their reproductive success From all these directions, we're getting data suggesting that this idea that women like sex less and that women are naturally more monogamous is really up for grabs now and that we need to really be accounting for actual human female behavior on the ground. And so it's exciting to see this science and it's really challenging for a lot of people. I should also say, and you're probably aware of this, but 
there are sex researchers who were challenging on the idea that androgen and testosterone are the main drivers mm. um, of libido. And of course, Rosemary Basson um, came up with this fascinating insight, which is that there are different kinds of desire. There's spontaneous desire in which men always almost always outpace women. And spontaneous desire is you're sitting there and suddenly you want to have sex just the way you might, you know, want to have a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> so on the measure of spontaneous desire, men always score higher than women. But Rosemary Basson said, I think there are these other desire styles going on. And she called them triggered or responsive desire. And mm -hmm. that, and men and women can both experience it, but it's when you are sitting there, you're not thinking about sex and then you're watching, you know, maybe you're watching an episode of Outlander um, or you're um, reading a sexy passage in a book or some guy or woman on the street just gives you like a really lustful glance or even you start fooling around and then you want to have sex. That's called triggered a responsive desire. And the fascinating thing is that when we measure triggered a responsive desire, sometimes women's libidos measure as higher than men. So we need to dig into that more. Totally. We, need to get, we totally need to get into that more. And, you know, it's interesting, Meredith Chivers did a study in 2014 where she had people in her lab at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, rate their responses to pornography and men and women were reporting equal levels of arousal. So everywhere we're seeing these challenges to our very easy assumptions about how men and women are different sexually, even the biology from Patricia Gowady's lab. So we live in interesting times. Oh, we sure do. And there's so many interesting research questions to still ask. I think that you know, there we will still find that there are some sex differences. Like it's not like you know, yeah. And I know you're not disagreeing with that, but I think it'll be interesting to see in in what more nuanced ways there are these differences. Because I I think we will continue to find that there are substantial average sex differences. Um, and re regarding porn viewing, I I saw this interesting statistic that I think maybe is consistent with what you're saying. They asked people to report what they're most likely men and women to report. Uh, and these are mostly college students, I should say. Some might not mm -hmm. generalize to adults. But why did they stop watching porn? You know, why they like change to mm -hmm. a new a new one or like move on. Uh -huh. Men like most men stopped watching porn when they orgasmed, whereas women stopped watching porn because of boredom. And there was a very, very striking sex difference there. And these are people in college. Yeah. So these and are was it a face to face interview? Was it a Anonymous I, I think these were just anonymous surveys. Anonymous, where they, yeah. You know, and so many more women in kind of standard kind of, you know, porn. I don't know what I mean by standard kind. But, <laughs> but, but, but well, this is what I mean by standard because I know there are some now there's cropping up like porn for women, you know, and there's a, yeah. there are certain mm -hmm. websites about that. But, you know, just in terms of like your run of the mill sort of like non-emotional or non like or just, you know, uh, totally like it's not even clear like the men and women are enjoying it, you know, in the porn. Uh -huh. Like like women are more likely to get bored with that and that's why they move on, you know, whereas, yeah, on yeah, average. Yeah. So through the lens, through the comparative lens, which is the one that I always like to use, I always want to ask where and how. So, for example, this is – um. It sounds like an interesting sample of college age people in the United States, in the industrialized West, which is a very specific world. So I would be very wary with my training in anthropology to extrapolate big sex differences based on that without visiting, revisiting and looking at it in different cultural contexts. And I don't mean just going to older groups of people or people in different states or, you know, people in France. I mean, looking at it comparatively, the worldwide data, I'm very wary of sort of asserting kind of a sense, just because of what I've seen. I'm wary of extrapolating a lot from those kind of studies that are very, very Western in their nature. So for sure, we might be able to say that there was this really interesting sex difference uh, between men and women in the industrialized West. And, and among college students. Yeah. And among college students. I, I love that. It's a really interesting finding. And then I would want to say before I 
took it further and, you know, said that we could make assertions about essential before we put that into a master narrative about essential sexual differences between men and women. I would want to find ways to go out into the world and compare it, you know, to the other worldwide ethnographic data, because I think that what has happened too often, and it does a disservice to men and women alike, is that we have extrapolated or presumed, okay, well, we found this in the site, like the famous Florida State University study, right? Yeah. Do you remember this great study where um, they got, it was in the 70s, and they got what they called, I loved this term, they found attractive male and female confederates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two, it just meant like people helping the psychologist. Yeah, just saying. And like, they do you want to do you want to come back to my place right do now? You yeah. come back to my place and have sex with me. And they made much of the fact um, that the women were much more likely to say no, I don't, uh, and the men were more, more likely to say yes, I do. And there might have been um, some essential reasons for that. So many years later, the study was revisited, I believe, by German researchers. What mm-hmm. is it about Germany? And uh, they found that when you removed variables such as fear of getting raped, fear of getting raped, fear of getting murdered, the fear of reputational assault, which women would face more than men, that the, the difference between who said yes was statistically insignificant, which kind of blew my mind. So I like to always run it through the comparative, you know, context. Sure. Before. Yeah. But so. No, I appreciate that. So this seems like there's kind of multiple points in your book. And, you know, one we we have definitely touched on a lot is the fluidity and uh, the importance of female choice and autonomy. And I think we've covered that really well. I just want to end here with the cheating one in particular, because I think there's different ways, there's different ways of interpreting it. So, yeah. so let me give you the most like cynical view of it, which is not your point at all of the book, but I could look at the data and say, well, all you're really saying is that women can be just as horrible human beings as men can. Like there are mm-hmm. horrible women, they're horrible right. men. Like, yeah. so one could, cause cheating, like, isn't cheating bad, like hurting your partner and like not having that, or at least like you know, like expressing your partner that like, look, I have these other sexual needs. Like, is it okay? You know, like if I, um, like maybe we, no, maybe you know, I asked you permission, but saying like, look, I'm going to leave the relationship. It would probably be healthier than secretly cheating on your partner. Are you viewing it as empowerment that, that women are out there like cheating on their partners? No, yeah. not at all. Not you at all. You see what I'm, I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. First of all, I'm very used, you know, being very upset about infidelity and it's I'm not upset. I'm trying topic. to, I'm, but I'm trying to no, be play devil's it's, advocate. It's, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It is really upsetting to be deceived. Um, right. It hurts. It, is really, it really is very painful. And, you know, a lot of couples therapists spend a lot of time with people who have experienced infidelity. I will say a few things. First of all, the reason that I wanted to focus on female infidelity, among other, first of all, it's just so fascinating. Like who isn't interested in people who decide, you know what, I'm not going to be monogamous anymore. It's just fascinating because it's it's still a taboo behavior. Uh, The second really interesting thing is what we find is that you know, through the comparative lens again, which is how I look at things, anywhere in the world where women have really high rates of meaningful political participation and meaningful labor force participation, wherever in the world those rates are high, you're going to see higher rates of female infidelity. So do I think by cheating a woman says, yeah, I'm empowered? No. But I think that where you see high rates of female infidelity, what the data show us is you see that women are indeed empowered on other metrics of female autonomy. So I think that female infidelity is a very telling metric Mm -hmm. of how a given nation or community feels about female autonomy. If you really do think that women deserve to be autonomous, your take on female infidelity will more likely be something like, this is a bad thing and it happens and it's part of the human condition, what can we do now? Where women don't have a lot of autonomy on other measures, you will tend to see that female infidelity can be very dangerous and even have lethal consequences. Um, For example, in the United States, uh, the social psychologist David Lay, who studies female infidelity. Oh, I like it. I know David Lay. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. And he studies the cuckold lifestyle and hot white thing. And he tells us that he believes, based on his expertise and the data that he's looked at, that 
just the suspicion of female infidelity and female infidelity are the greatest triggers of domestic violence. Mm. So other experts tell us that aside from school shootings, uh, one of the most common triggers, if you will, for a mass shooting is gendered coercive violence in which a man is attempting to kill his ex, someone who has left him and whoever happens to be around her at the moment. So we have to be very real about the fact that in the United States for women committing infidelity, can have lethal consequences. And we think of ourselves as a very enlightened nation. Um, So that fact really got me thinking, and I hope we'll get other people thinking too, about is it possible that the way we respond to female infidelity tells us how we feel about the most basic form of female autonomy, that we don't like it? And what does that tell us about ourselves um, as people and as a nation? It's a challenging question. Um, Infidelity in general challenges us on a lot of levels. And I think especially female infidelity, it challenges everything we believe about gender and what's right and women as the guardians um, of monogamy. I should say something else, which is that a fair number of couples therapists now are looking more to the segmented model of marriage uh, when they work with people experiencing infidelity or people who are struggling with monogamy. So the segmented model of marriage is one that was put forward uh, by the psychotherapist uh, Michelle Schenkman. Mm-hmm. And what she put out there was that in Latin America and parts of Europe, there's a belief uh, that marriage is a wonderful thing and that we get a lot out of it, but that it can't satisfy all our needs. And that there are cultures where people believe that their marriages are valuable and they'll go to their graves, you know, invested in their marriages and doing everything they can for them, but they look for their sexual needs to be met elsewhere. So this is a model that some people are looking at now. Do we really believe that we can be everything to our partners for an entire lifetime. And Esther Perel has crossed over Michelle Shankman's insights and writings in a big, wonderful, helpful way. Another thing that's going on is, again, for example, within consensual non-monogamy, this idea of disclosing, of telling your partner, we need to have this discussion, what should we do, and approaching it. And so there's a big value in consensual non-monogamy placed on transparency Mm. and on being honest and telling people. Mm. So these are some of the solutions. Another solution that I've seen um, to the dilemma is couples decide, when you write a book like this, people tell you a lot of stuff. So couples couples who remain committed to each other, uh, but decide to adventure together or adventure or adventure separately and use their relationship and their relationship remains the home base. So, you know, back to humans being these endlessly creative, flexible, sexual and social strategists, I think we're applying our creativity right now to the pair bond and trying to see what we can do, how we can innovate, where we can go with it. And some people are going to want to leave it just as is. Um, But I think it helps a lot to get out there uh, the simple truth that the vast majority of us will have a hard time living out exclusivity for a lifetime with total zeal. And that's okay. And it just becomes, what do you want to do about it? Yeah. You're challenging lots of uh, these standard assumptions. Another big assumption is that men and women cheat for different reasons. I mean, you've seen that in the literature for years and years and years that women cheat because their emotional needs aren't being met, whereas men cheat, you know, like, and that's, that's not fair to men too. Like what men only care about sex. Like really? Like I hate the way, can I just say, I hate the way the science and social science has profiled men and backed them into a corner. I'm not a fan. (laughs) I'm not a fan. I'm not fans of that. I, Sometimes I think that, you know, bad social science and science has, is really culpable in our current cultural crisis, you know, that brought us Me Too and that brought us really reactionary ideas about men and women, that bad science did a big disservice to men as well. Saying that it's more natural, that men are more naturally sexually assertive, that they're more naturally sexual than women are, because that's kind of not just paving the way to provide cover for bad behavior, it's profiling men and it's making them into the enemies of women. And 
that's not the way it is, what the newer science is showing us and what the social scientists that I interviewed and the experts who are therapists like you who see people and work with couples every day. Tammy Nelson told me something so interesting. She wrote a book called The New Monogamy. And she, she mm. talks about how monogamy is a continuum. And she says, monogamy can mean anything from, please don't look at porn. It hurts my feelings. It's a betrayal of our bond. Monogamy can be everything from that to like, go ahead and have sex with other people as long as you're giving our relationship total priority and you'll stop if I ask you to. She says, that whole continuum we should think of as the new monogamy. But a big point that she's careful to make when she speaks, when she's interviewed, is that in her years and years of experience dealing with couples and infidelity, she says to me, men and women's motivations are so much closer than we have allowed. And many, many men, she says, in my practice and the practices of my colleagues, are cheating, if you want to call it that, for emotional intimacy. And many women are cheating, if we want to call it that, in pursuit of a great orgasm. Um, so our motivations are closer than we've really been allowed uh, to acknowledge. And I think it's great that there's emerging science um, that's allowing us to reconsider this. Just one other researcher that I spoke with is Alicia Walker. And she's a sex researcher and sociologist at the uh, Missouri State University, sorry. And she worked with several different samples, groups of women, but she uh, worked with groups of women who were just completely using affairs, if you will, as a strategy to get sex in marriages that were otherwise satisfying to them, but they they were not able to get sexual satisfaction in their marriages. Um, they were sexually incompatible with their husbands or their long-term partners. They were in sexless marriages, whatever it was. So they were availing themselves of outside partnerships in order to have sex. And they told uh, Dr. Walker, I am not unhappy in my marriage. It's just that my marriage is sexless or that sexually unsatisfying but my marriage is valuable in lots of lots of other ways. I'm just going on the side here simply for sexual satisfaction. And she found that these women were auditioning men and asking them questions like, you know, what are you interested in sexually? What is your how would you rate your skills in X, Y and Z? Are you happy with a completely sexual thing instead of a relationship? Because that's what I'm looking for. Okay. That kind of flew in the face of what I was expecting and what we expect uh, that women are going to want and desire. So, you know, the research of people like Dr. Walker and the findings of people uh, like Tammy Nelson are really challenging us oh. to rethink all the things that oh, yeah. we've comfortably assumed about not just what women want, but who women are and who yeah. men are. So, yeah, it's fascinating topic not just science, but, you know, the culture, like the Me Too movement, everything, it seems to, there's something in the air where women aren't taking as much shit from men anymore. <laughs> it seems like there's, a, I mean, it seems like there's a more general, there's a, I feel like all this stuff, there's a more general point is that women aren't as satisfied anymore with unsatisfactory sex. They're not satisfied anymore with, with abuses of power. They're not as sad. Do you know what I mean? There's like a whole list of things that like, there's just, a whole list of things, right? right? For so long, I think female sexuality meant, and this isn't because men are bad people or there weren't good committed male sex researchers and social scientists, there always have been. But I think that what happened for a long time is that female sexuality was reduced to sort of women being sexy for men in the popular culture. And Me Too has been really interesting for the way that the women and men who participate in it are sort of saying, Female desire is not an extension of male desire. Let's look at it as this separate thing. Um, so mm. my hope with a movement like Me Too or, you know, the songs of Cardi B and Beyonce mm. or the scripted series like, oh, gosh, there's so many great ones now, like Orange is the New Black and um, Outlander is one that I come back to again and again. It's like porn practically or insecure by Issa Rae. I think that what all these cultural movements are doing is they're sort of saying, okay, you know, me too and stuff. We've, we've told you what women don't want. And we've told you that female desire is not just an extension of male desire. Now I think we've opened up the space where we can say, okay, female desire, what is it? 
We've told you what women don't want and won't tolerate. Now let's talk about what women do want and what we like and who we are sexually speaking. So maybe I'm a Pollyanna, but I find, <laughs> it a very, I find it a very exciting cultural moment, not only because of what's going on in sex research, but because of what's going on in scripted TV and anthropology and the music industry. Yeah. There's a lot of possibility. A lot of possibility. I think the more that we open up the freedom and autonomy for men and women to express their full sexuality, it'll we'll all have hotter sex. I guess I'll end on that point. Yeah, uh, that's a great point to end on. Better, yeah. better science can help us have better sex. Right? <laughs> and be happier and, and leave more meaningful lives. I'm going to end, I will end on a quote of yours uh, to that point. So I thought I'd quote you. There can be no autonomy without the autonomy to choose without coercion or constraint, or in spite of it, who our lovers will be. So thank you so much for your thoughtful, comparative, comprehensive work and challenging a lot of uh, stereotypes. Thank you so much for having me on, Scott, and for bringing psychology to so many people. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. 